Well, good morning, everyone. I'm sc oh. Good morning everyone, I'm Scott from the Old Curiosity Shop. It's Mother's Day weekend and it's a cold, rainy weekend here on the Northeast. In the Northeast or on the Northeast? Well, it's where I am and the weather is poo. But I am going to get to see my mother on Mother's Day and right now I'm down in, up in a very industrial, gritty section of Philadelphia. No surprise there. Right along the river in sort of a warehouse district and there's a flea market, so I have high hopes, but you never really know, so mask on and let's see what's what. Of course, I'm gonna take you with me. I'm not very good filming when I'm walking around flea markets, but I'll try, I'll try. Say what? Say what? The ladder? It's twelve dollars. It's solid. Go ten bucks on it. Ten dollar bill. I 
everyone I am just as excited as I can possibly be I am uh, freshly back from the flea market and take a look at look at what is on the back of my truck now let's zoom in on it here and as we do you say oh my goodness Scott that is a mess look here's uh, all kinds of dirt and if we spin it around we've got this is, this is mouse pee here, I promise you. I know what mouse pee smells like. We've got veneer that's sort of bubbling up here. We have a big split right here. That doesn't look good. Look at the finish, it's terrible. Now let's go up to this end. It's all dented up here, but what is this? Well, let's turn it back around this way. You already figured out it's a phonograph horn, but it's not just a phonograph horn. It is the phonograph horn. It's a Victor Oak, what collectors call a spear tip horn. And that's because these look like the tips of spears here around the outside of the horn. It is made of oak, quarter sawn oak, and it's two layers of paper thin, and I mean paper thin oak veneer. And it's a large size, as I said, oak horn. You can see how beautiful the oak is, and look at the detail on the outside. These horns are hard to find, highly sought after, and when you find one on a decent phonograph, you will pay thousands. I mean, it's not uncommon to see Phonographs with oak with wooden horns to sell for three to three thousand four thousand uh, and Depending on the condition now. This is just the horn and it's rough, but it's fully restorable and This this will be absolutely fully restored 
fully restored uh, that horn I'd have to check some some recent comps I know the values have fallen a bit on phonographs but this particular wooden horn is gonna date to around 1907 1908 something like that and um, you can see the remnants let's see just barely right here I don't know you may be able to see right under there is the is the old Victor Victrola uh, decal I'm gonna be able to bring that out it's covered in shellac now and so you can barely see it under there but there it is I'll let you take a look at the inside again uh, turn it around and get a little bit I think I went out of focus there a little bit of uh, light on it okay so that was a wonderful find uh, I've never found one of these before I'm so excited to have found it and I can't wait to get the restoration going on it then we'll get it uh, all set up on an antique phonograph and it's going to absolutely be be wonderful uh, I paid $80 for it and I danced all the way back to the truck wonderful well, now, just in case you are curious, this is what a beautiful oak horn looks like on a Victor machine. Now, these horns were an upgrade. When you went and bought yourself a Victor talking machine, uh, the standard horn would either be a uh, black, what's called a witch's hat horn, or the morning glory horn people are usually familiar with, made of stamped metal and painted black. This, however, if you had, uh, if your pockets were a little deeper and you had an extra $15 back in 1910, you could upgrade to one of these oak horns. And that's what they sold for, 15 bucks. And they were offered by Victor as an upgrade from just after the turn of the century when the company was founded. So they started making them around in 1903 or so, and I think... They made them until 1920. By 1920, these outside horn machines were out of style. And it was, uh, they were considered old fashioned by 1920. And the Victrola with its beautiful mahogany cabinet and interior horn is what was preferred in folks' parlors and living rooms at that time. And so, but there it is, there's the oak horn. And now we can see here is a uh, another image of it from the back and this one is appears to be uh, mounted on a Victor 3 or what's called Victor the uh, third talking machine that's the model that it's on and I can tell by the pictures that this has been refinished the oak shellac turns almost black uh, after years and years and years and um, the example that I have is going to have to be completely stripped and refinished and all of that work done. Will it look as good as the one you see in these photographs? No, it'll be a little rough around the edges, but these horns can add $1,000 of value to a machine. In other words, that Victor 3 machine that you're looking at, if it had a black uh, pinstriped morning glory horn on it, it would sell, depending on the overall condition, for about $1,500, which is about $1,000 less than they sold for 15 years ago or so. But if you throw on an oak horn, you can now expect to double your money, and uh, now you're looking at $25 to $3,000 just with that oak horn added. So the 80 bucks that I paid, I was thrilled. And even though it's still gonna be a little rough around some of the edges, uh, it's still going to be a beautiful horn that's going to be worth around $1,000 when I finish it. Okay, now, thanks for listening to all that history on the uh, phonograph horns. Uh, let's go inside and take a quick peek on the kitchen counter. Okay, I certainly don't want to be repetitive, so I'm not going to ramble on about anything that you see. I just want to make sure that, you know, it's all up and running in the old curiosity shop right now. I think I already talked about most of these things in some past videos. So if you see anything and you want some more detail, either check out the video archives in the last four or five days or so, or look at the description. Please visit my eBay store. The link is in the description box below and you can see better pictures and full descriptions of everything you see. So quickly, 
Um, the wonderful fruit bowl with the Bakelite knives and the butterscotch handles here, 1930s. This is the way it was manufactured. Uh, Iris and Herringbone by Jeanette. And whether some other company bought the glass and then did all this fancy chrome work and whatnot, um, I don't know. Because the chrome is not marked Farber Brothers or any such thing, so um, not sure who's responsible for that, but it was done in the third in the 1930s. There's the pretzel jar. I think um, that it was, uh, let's see, Hawking. Nice big, big jar there. Uh, a cake, a uh, cake, a deviled egg plate. I sold my last one and we are in summertime is coming, so not everybody can find these deviled egg plates. I find them pretty easily, but look at that. You'll be the hit of the Grange Hall when you walk in with your deviled eggs on that. The little porcelain piece probably from a dresser set. There's our cake serving thing. Uh, a wonderful cake plate that I never did really identify the, uh, the maker of in, in a beautiful emerald green color. Stands on four little feet. The Hazel Atlas celery dish this time in the Moroccan amethyst. The wonderful German bowl here, probably a bread bowl, uh, all hand painted with that beautiful bird inside and, and uh, several of you told me who that bird was and I can't remember now. Um, but you did tell me and I appreciate that. Thank you everyone. Anytime you send me any emails and help me out, I do appreciate it. It's sometimes hard to keep track of everybody. And then these I don't think you saw. That's a little made in Japan piece there, all hand painted. I think you can see, so this is the, probably the first time you've seen this. Uh, just as hand painted Japan. So this is a piece made sometime in the, uh, after the uh, depression, depression era. Uh, a Pyrex lid for your refrigerator dish. Uh, and a wonderful sizzling steak plate in this hammered aluminum. And I was kind of surprised when I saw what these are, what they sell for, but it is Wagner ware. We can see right there. I get focused in. And back here we've got the original sizzling steak platter, trademark, with a patent number on it and everything. And this is in really good condition. Okay, so you can serve your sizzling steak in style. That's everything that's old that you've seen before, and it's all listed in the old curiosity shop right now. Go get it. All right, let's go do something else. Well, I am about to leave you, but before I do, I've got one more little video clip coming up after... I explain what you're looking at right now. Well, what we're looking at right now is a 1920s living room. And yes, living room was being used and, and widely accepted in the 1920s. Thank you, Edward Bach, publisher of the Ladies Home Journal at the Curtis Publishing Company here in Philadelphia. And when you go through the old magazines of the 1920s, and you look at the house plans, you will see that the word parlor is gone. Nobody is using the word parlor. It has been replaced by living room. Now, yes, I know, even my father said when he was a boy in the 1950s, his grandmother would refer to her front parlor, but she was born in the 1880s, and those old Victorians, as you know, still refer to their front rooms as parlors, but Philadelphia publisher Edward Bach didn't coin the phrase, but he popularized it and through the Ladies Home Journal promoted uh, a more functional room and many times would make fun of the quote unquote drawing room. Uh, there's a, a funny quote that's something like, I'm, I'll paraphrase it to the, uh, he said he wasn't sure what the drawing room was supposed to draw other than attention to people with too much money and bad taste. <laughs> I think that that's a, a loose uh, remembrance of his quotation. So it's even though people are still saying parlor, 
all of the magazines and all of the house plans of those days are saying living room and we see this shift in the 1920s after this after the first world war and people you know hairdressers are investing two dollars in the stock market and making enough money to stuff their living rooms with art deco furniture um, unlike the very colonial revival looking living room that we see right here there's nothing art modern about that at all but it was a competing the competing style with what would come in as art modern anyway now i'm really getting off topic so let's get back on topic we are looking at a living room from the 1920s what are some of the things that you notice what stands out well the juxtaposition of the furniture it's not shoved up against the wall it's on angles and there are throw rugs on top of uh, large carpets large old you know olsen carpets we can see nothing is matchy matchy we've got color galore and we really see the jewel tones are the star so don't think that everything back in the 1920s and 30s was gloom 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 what a refreshing living room um, i could jump into that picture right now because i'm tired of all this gray 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 come on everybody we've been locked down for a year let's get some color and some glass and some texture and some wood and some upholstery back into our homes anyway I really wasn't going to jump on that soap wagon, soap wagon, soap box. What I really wanted to do is say, I'm going to show you in a second a video. I found something in a thrift shop and I almost wet my pants. How many of you know what this is? Now, I'm not going to tell you until I come back in the next video. But this is a, uh, there's, this is a particular uh oh i guess i'm saying too much anyway look at the video that's coming up see if you get as excited as i was when i found this item it would fit perfectly in that living room that you're looking at right there and then i'll be back in a day or two and i'll uh, tell you all about the piece that i found okay that's gonna be it everybody i'm scott from the old curiosity shop saying thanks for watching and so long for now